Yes. Okay, let's turn to today and, and, and Richard Moss. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Richard. He's a senior scientist at Pacific Northwest National Lab. Uh, he runs the Joint Global Change Research Institute there. He's also an adjunct professor in geophysical sciences at the University of Maryland. This year, however, uh, he's visiting as a senior visiting research scientist at Columbia University's Earth Institute, uh, one of my former affiliations. Uh, Richard's research focuses on a variety of things, but he looks at scenarios, vulnerability and adaptation, and also uncertainty characterization. Previously, he served uh, as a director of the U.S. Global Change Research Program. He's been the head of the technical support for Working Group 2 of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and also director of Climate and Energy at the UN Foundation and World Wildlife Fund. Most importantly, he's actually one of us. Uh, he got his PhD and MPA from the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. And without further ado, he's going to tell us about the science to inform uh, climate adaptation and mitigation. Thanks so much, Richard. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm not dressed for the snow. I hope you guys are. As somebody told me, it was going to be three to six inches. So we'll see. Um, so what I'm, just to situate what I'm going to talk about is um, there's not going to be uh, very much in the way of quantitative results shown in this presentation. I'm talking really about a public policy problem. Uh, and the problem is this. Uh, our national processes to inform decision makers about climate change have largely been, do, I mean, they're doing a great job, but what they've been doing is telling people we have a problem. Uh, and if you look at what's about to come out, there will be uh, probably the day after Thanksgiving the release of the next National Climate Assessment, and I'll talk about this in greater detail. This is a big document. It's produced by 13 federal agencies, um, and I think the administration wants to bring it out in a news hole, which is why they're going to bring it out the day after Thanksgiving. Um, but it tells people what's vulnerable, and I'll show you the, the structure of that report. But what it does not do is tell people what information they need to take action, right? So when you start to, to go out and talk to people in cities and states, not in the federal government, the counties, they're interested in implementing mitigation plans in their communities, and they're interested in doing things that help improve the resilience of their communities, you know, improving flood control structures and so forth. But what they don't know is how to do it so that it's going to be suited to new climate conditions. And that's a big challenge. We're telling people they shouldn't use climatology, the historical record. They should use something else. We're not telling them what to use. Um, so this talk is about how we could pivot this system that continues to produce these great reports about vulnerability into something that practitioners could actually use to inform what they're trying to do now. So the background is this, and why I'm on leave, is I was chairing a federal advisory committee that the Obama administration started to look into this problem. And in August of 2017, the Trump administration shut it down. Uh, and several of us on the committee um, felt that this topic was too important and that we were going to find some way to continue to do this. And so uh, we were fortunate enough to get support from New York State um, on behalf of a wider group of states called the U.S. Climate Alliance, from the American Meteorological Society and Columbia, uh, which provided me a year of my time, to revive the panel and finish our work. Uh, and so that's what we've been doing this past year, and that's why I really had to take a leave of absence from Pacific Northwest National Lab, since this was something that the administration can discontinued and the lab is part of the Department of Energy. Uh, it wasn't appropriate work for me to do there. Um, but I've had a great, it's been a, a real wonderful thing for me. I've had a tremendous opportunity. Um, some of you in the audience on the faculty side have been on federal advisory committees. And you know it's not, they're not very easy processes. There are a lot of rules in place that govern how you can interact with people, partly because it's all about, you know, the sunshine laws. They want, we want everything that's passed into these committees to be available to everyone so we don't have private sector deals being cut, for example, with what government might do. So it's important stuff to do it that way, but it's also very um, difficult to work in that environment. Um, 
so the things that I'm going to talk about are this new approach to climate assessment. Um, and part of it's about changing the role of civil society and how we organize civil society to start taking on a function that's previously been done by the government. And I think there are also a lot of pretty deep issues that have to do with the role of basic science and how it gets applied and synthesized again in the world of action. So the backdrop for all of this is this concept in the climate world of assessments. Uh, and what you see here are the covers from the last complete uh, full IPCC assessment, the fifth assessment report. Um, and what these assessments do is they're big processes, hundreds of scientists participate, and they produce consensus knowledge. And what I mean by that is they'll evaluate you know, the dozens or hundreds of studies that are relevant to a particular topic. They figure out which ones are really strong, which ones maybe not so strong. How could we, you know, what conclusions should we draw from the body of knowledge about things like how much is climate changing, how sensitive is climate to human interference, uh, how likely is it that hydrological systems are going to be affected and where. So it's, you know, it's answer, answering and asking these questions, which are sort of in working group one, you know, how much is changing in the climate system and where. The sort of second question is the so what if climate is changing, does it matter? That's working group two, the impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability, and where I was the director of the technical support unit for a while. Um, working group three is the now what, and I think a lot of the space of your work in the en on energy, um, what can we do about this? Where can we start to transform the energy system into a new one that doesn't fuel the climate problem? Uh, as well as fueling us. And then finally, the synthesis report, which is an interesting activity um, because it synthesizes all three areas and just sort of into a what-if analysis. If, the tech, if we develop these sorts of technologies, what will it buy us in terms of emissions reductions in the future? Um, if population trends move in a certain direction, how does that affect the problem? So it's a really, it's an integrated approach. Um, and it's really important to do these kinds of processes because, you, because no one researcher could do it on their own. Uh, and because you're using the information that's available at a specific point in time, it's really important that we characterize levels of confidence and uncertainty and give the policymakers an understanding of how long do they need to wait for better information. Um, but the other thing for anybody that's been particularly involved in IPCC will know is that these are very cautious and deliberative processes. Um, from beginning to end, it's over, over two years or two and a half years from the time that the outline is approved to when you have a completed report. And when you actually read the conclusions, they're very heavily caveated. Um, anybody that tells you these are alarmist documents and exaggerating the state of science, you know, what we understand and how bad the problem is, they, they haven't really read the reports because once you read them, you see how cautious people are. So the point I want you to take from this is that assessment is kind of different from science. It's an evaluative process, but it's really crucial for helping people know how well do we know things and what can we do about it. So in the United States, we have a process, which I alluded to. It's called the U.S. Global Change Program. It was established by law in 1990, uh, the Global Change Research Act. And it, among other things, says that these 13 agencies, which include NASA, NOAA, National Science Foundation, Department of Energy, and others, have to collaborate to produce a unified research program on climate science. And one of the features is that they have to produce a U.S. assessment and what this shows is just the outline. Um, and what's really required in the public law is most of these kinds of national topics, like the impacts of climate change on water or energy uh, or agriculture or forestry and so forth. Uh, but they also do these regional cross cuts where they'll take the important systems in the Northwest and look at how they may interact so you get some sense of are there potential impact cascades uh, involved. Uh, and then there is a very little bit of response, you know, the sort of what we can do about it in terms of adaptation and mitigation. But these are really very light treatments in this document. 
Um, and so, you know, keep this in mind. I'll show it again, but this is required by law, and it's about to be released, as I said, we think the day after Thanksgiving. Um, and it's a tribute to the people in government who have remained in their posts that this is actually getting produced um, in the administration. But what's also significant is that it's approved by the administration. Um, I was at a meeting yesterday with a group of lawyers, uh, a guy from ne the Netherlands was talking about how they used one of the IPCC reports to require the fact that the net Dutch government signed off on the IPCC report enabled them to use it in a court of law to get the government to strengthen uh, the Dutch uh, performance on, on environmental change and climate change. Uh, so these documents are not unimportant. I don't know that we could use it in our court system, um, but, but it's a government statement. And so there's one other assessment related process that I just want to refer to. So um, there's a lot of research that says reports are not effective ways to communicate with policymakers and decision makers. Uh, they get the document, they read it, they don't really know how to interpret it. And so as it's highlighted up here, a better way to do it is to set up some kind of an ongoing participatory process where stakeholders and um, scientists are engaged in a co-discovery communication and application process. And we called this sustained assessment, um, and it was said to improve um, salience or relevance, legitimacy, and credibility. Um, and the idea was that instead of just producing reports, a conversation itself becomes part of the process. So you could imagine setting up a working group on a particular topic that involves different people and that sustained interaction across those people is a product, not just a process. Uh, but there's also more that comes out of it. Um, and in 2013, um, I was part of a group that recommended that the U.S. government move in this direction uh, with the idea of making the information more useful. And it was adopted by the U.S. Global Change Program, uh, but um, has stalled. So this new committee that we res resurrected, I just wanted to show you the members of it, um, and it uh, will end when we finish our report. Um, uh, it's sort of comprised of three sets of people, climate and related scientists, people in city and state and county government, uh, and then some groups who are in the NGO community who are involved in actually applying uh, climate science and adaptation. Um, and so it's, a, I, it's been really a great group to work with. We don't, nobody gets any salary, but we do have support for our ongoing interactions and travel. And our, this is just a table of contents from our report, which will come out sometime early next year. Um, and the thing to take away here really is this chapter, chapter two, practitioner perspectives and needs. We, we've been able to get great input from cities and states about what information they're looking for. Uh, and then the rest of it just describes uh, different ideas about how to improve the assessment process. Um, which I, some of which I'll talk about specifically, but not so much what's in Chapter 4, which includes really specific analysis of things like the potential use of artificial intelligence uh, and uh, machine learning uh, to start analyzing new, uh, for example, utility and other data on the impact side, um, the use of things like citizen science, which is a great mechanism for both engaging the public as well as getting data on impacts that we otherwise don't have. Everybody has in their pocket a great potential instrument for collecting data about impacts, and we're not really harnessing it very effectively yet. So it's both this new structure as well as specific technologies, and I don't, in this talk, want to spend much time on the technologies. So I have one slide to just explain a little bit about the sort of information that the practitioners are asking for. Uh, and the current status on the ground. So one thing to say is that there's been a lot of progress in implementing adaptation and mitigation. You look at the releases that come out of New York City or San Francisco or Chicago. These are cities that are, you know, they're big cities, they're well resourced, but they are implementing measures that help reduce their energy use, um, you know, traffic flow um, uh, work or lighting, um, or they're trying to do things that reduce flooding you know, green roofs or uh, building up uh, more open space that where water can collect uh, and then run off more slowly, um, you know, creating less of a problem for combined sewer overflows or that kind of technology. But um, there are also a lot of cities that haven't even started 
down this road that have no vulnerability assessment, which is a crucial step to understanding what your vulnerabilities are, uh, and no adaptation plans. Um, but the most significant finding is this third one, that where people have plans, they can't move any further. They get the plan in place, and then they can't implement. It is hard for them to implement. And so we've been able to talk to them about why that is. And so the, the key issue that they confront is how do we mainstream this information you're giving us into the things that we normally do, like establish a building code or zoning ordinances. Um, you know, you look at the FEMA flood maps, for example, they're really not in a good state. If you live in a coastal area or even outside that, what you want to understand is where might flooding occur, and that's where you would go to get that information. If it's not updated properly, um, I mean, it's currently not updated properly for other reasons, but w including thinking about the future lifetime of the infrastructure and what it has to be ready for, uh, you're going to be building in places that you're likely to experience flooding. You're going to be pouring you know, good money after bad results. So it's these sorts of things, the updating of codes and policies, um, obtaining financing, um, you know, Moody's and Standard and Poor's do bond rating. Um, and they evaluate how likely is it that a city or state is going to be able to pay back the bond that they've been issued. And they're realizing that climate issues should be considered in that, but they're not sure how to do it. Uh, they're developing methods, um, but there's no accepted um, tested practice. I don't like the phrase best practice, but the idea is how should you do this? What kind of climate information should you be using to do it? and so forth. Um, monitoring and evaluation is another big issue where they're looking for input. So what they've asked for to help them solve these problems are, you know, I've talked about sustained partnerships and support networks. Um, they want some sense of what's authoritative applied data and tested practices. Um, they're very interested, it's interesting, in, they're ahead of the academic community in this sense. Um, they don't want just adaptation or mitigation. They want information that's about the relationship of the two and how those relate to things like capital improvement planning or sustainable development, because they only have one budget. They don't have a separate adaptation budget. They need to think about this in, in, in an integrated way. So what our committee is suggesting is that given that there is an urgent need, you know, you can just read, pick up the newspaper, you know, this month it's the fires in California, uh, earlier months it's been the hurricane damage, um, and so forth. The federal government isn't going to do this. Right now the leadership is pointing in the wrong direction, but even when it was the Obama administration we were having challenges pulling this together because of the difficulties that the agencies have in these sort of sustained dialogues. We've recommended that we establish a new process, a civil society based, uh, what we're calling, for lack of a better name, maybe one of you will have a better idea, climate assessment consortium. That would be um, bring together different users of climate science, so that includes the state, tribal, and local governments, but also users in the sense of engineering and other professional societies that need this information to try to update their manual of practice and their codes and standards with the people who are producing the science. So that includes uh, people at organizations like GFDL who are doing climate science, but then also groups like here at Princeton which are involved in thinking about um, you know, hydrological research or other areas where you're thinking about downstream impacts of climate change. Uh, and what we propose to do is bring these groups together around problem-focused partnerships um, that would evaluate the use of this information. And I'll show you uh, what I mean. Um, so this is uh, just kind of an overview that compares, uh, in the left-hand column, the current national climate assessment and then what this extended applied assessment might do. Um, so, you know, you saw the organization by sector and region in the outline I showed. This is going to be defined by these problems. It's going to have not just reports, but the products from the, uh, these partnerships. Um, and it's going to produce tested practice, not just an assessment of vulnerabilities and risks. So um, these are examples of the topics uh, that we're talking about. So rather than having a a Pacific Northwest chapter or a water sector chapter, um, what the practitioners have said is we need information that helps us get ready and manage the risk of catastrophic wildfire. 
Um, some measure, you know, some wildfire level of fire is good because it restores the ecosystem, but what happens when it gets really out of control? Uh, and what kind of climate science is available to help us do that? And how do we understand which of these ecosystem models and fire models we should be employing to develop projections uh, of future risk? Uh, or, you know, inland flooding is another huge problem for many communities because of the greater intensity of precipitation in many parts of the country uh, as a result of the acceleration of the hydrological cycle. Um, where should they be sourcing information for that and how can they apply it? So you can see that the, it's in a way what we're suggesting here is we need a completely different level of analysis or unit of analysis that's focused on these sorts of interdisciplinary problems. Um, another way of thinking about this is to think about what's necessary to implement a project. So this is just a standard kind of a, a mix really between a project implementation cycle uh, and an adaptive management cycle where, you know, you have, you identify what the problem is in a framing step, you're synthesizing the information you have about the problem, you're designing options to address it, you're looking at how you would appraise and make decisions. Uh, enacting those decisions and then monitoring their effectiveness. So what this assessment might do, for example, is con conduct an evaluation of the convening methods that we use to bring decision makers together. And maybe a best example of that is in many coastal communities, particularly, for example, in the Gulf, um, people realize that protection in place isn't going to be a viable option for the long term. So they're looking at some type of managed retreat. That's a really existential thing for a community, and how do you organize and convene a conversation that will involve town leaders, uh, citizens, businesses to talk about what happens when our community can no longer be here because the costs of protection are just going to be too high. There's really great literature in the social sciences about bringing people together under those circumstances and convening these sorts of conversations. And we think that this assessment process should be evaluating some of that and giving people some guidance on how to do it. Um, another example here is just kind of looking at the different chains of modeling that we use, climate modeling to hydrological modeling to flood modeling um, to catastrophe modeling to think about the potential for storms and what are the right combinations and ways of linking these models. Uh, I'm involved in a project for the Department of Energy, at, um, even though I'm mostly on leave, that does look at sort of new combinations, complex system science around um, using more operational models in energy and water in particular uh, in, in an integrated modeling system to understand how these systems could interact. So there's great research, but also a need to help assess people. Um, very underprovided resource right now is science and dialogue with engineering and other communities about using what we understand about climate science, using projections to develop new, a new sense of what the design storms of the future need to be, uh, as well as how we do more adaptive design processes. Um, in this step, um, there's evaluation of benefit cost analysis methods which are not well suited for making decisions about what adaptation and mitigation measures uh, to include, um, as well as things like robust decision making. Uh, this week out in the LA area, there is a meeting of the groups that do this robust decision making uh, under deep uncertainty uh, talking about this issue. Um, here's where I mentioned, you know, the things about how you would incorporate climate information into financial analysis and other things. And then finally, once you've taken a step, what indicators can you use to evaluate whether it's doing what you thought it was? Is it really reducing emissions as much as you thought? Um, are you still seeing flooding in places where you've been seeing flooding or not? Um, there needs to be long-term data collection using things that are practical for cities to be able to collect. So. You know, again, the, the, what I hope you take away from that is that it's a very different flavor of analysis than here's a projection of climate change, here's a projection of how those, you know, what the crop models say the change in yield is going to be. This is a very different type of analysis that's currently not getting done. Um, so a couple of points about how we would do this, right? We're saying it's not going to be done in the federal government, and that raises a lot of challenges. 
Um, and so what we've adopted is an idea that we could work with a network of networks where in existing centers of excellence on some of these topics are brought together to form these communities of practice. So say a university has a leading center as Columbia does on water uh, issues. Uh, the Columbia Water Center. They could, for example, s serve as a node of this network and help convene some of the communities of practice to evaluate different methods and how they could be applied. Um, so it's really a model that's attempting to build on existing areas of strength. Um, the other, other approach that we've talked about is uh, one that would be based in a combination of professional societies and scientific societies. So we've been talking with the American Geophysical Union, the American Association for Advancement of Science, and the American Meteorological Society about the possibility of their uh, convening uh, this process. Um, and so it really is intended to build on the existing work that's on, on the way, underway in society. Um, and where people are learning how to do this, but go away from just one method or one project and look across different projects. It's kind of case study or comparative analysis uh, is a way of thinking about it. Uh, and we, you know, we recognize that it's going to be important to continue to relate to this ongoing national climate assessment process. Um, one other thing that's interesting, I think, is this uh, relationship with climate science firms. So, um, or service firms. So this is the idea that just as within meteorology, you know, NOAA produces basic information, but then a lot of private companies take that information and process it for specific industries, energy or fisheries, uh, or, you know, recreational industries to give people targeted forecasts. The expectation is that the private sector is going to move much more aggressively into starting to fill some of these needs. So if you're in a city and you need a climate projection to design a bridge or, you know, a state, where would you go? You'd go to one of these climate sector firms. Uh, or service firms like AECOM is starting to do this, or ICF is another one that's starting to. There's no standards for what they should be providing. And when you talk to somebody in the state, the first thing I was asked after we started with New York State was, will your group help us evaluate proposals that we're getting from contractors to know which are the ones we should use and which ones not? They have no basis at this point for making those judgments because they're not the specialists in this field, but it's a decision they have to make. So it's just in the spirit of saying this is going to be moving forward, whether we like it or not, it's moving forward. and it. Behooves, I think it behooves those of us in the academy, um, you know, the, the research community, to think about how do how do we help people take advantage of what we know, so when they're taking decisions, they're they're good ones. Um, and this is just again a little bit on the business model. I don't want to go into this in length, other than to say that. I think we're going to need a three to five year period of, of philanthropic support to get this launched, but that eventually we'll be able to get cities and states and others to provide membership input through dues. Um, that I think that there'll be a co-funding model with university and other centers where we can get, um, among other things, federal agencies which are interested in this uh, at an agency level to provide uh, money for different projects, as well as some fee-for-service work pulling together special reports and that kind of thing. So I think there is a long-term model for this civil society group to do this in a way that will match it with what the federal government is putting together. So. You know, I apologize that a lot of this has probably seemed fairly abstract, and maybe I should have had more specific examples. Um, but it is a work in progress, um, and you know, it's really designed to try to reply, uh, re respond to what these practitioners in cities and states have told us they're looking for. Um, and we have we've had a first meeting of a convening board last week, um, which is helping us look for funding and get this thing started. Um, and, you know, I do think that there are questions about, um, at a university, for example, how do we fund projects, you know, because everybody needs to get funding to do their work, that also are going to have this applied character. Um, and I think that the budget situation in the longer term is going to get harder and harder 
because uh, we cannot sustain the deficit funding that we're funding, and research seems to always be on the chopping block pretty early in the process. Um, using something like this as an opportunity for developing new sources of funding from industry, for example, the private sector, where they have a risk through supply chains or whatever, and they're interested in learning more about it. But I think it's going to require us to change some of our models about how we do that work. Um, and, you know, I don't know um, how it's going to turn out with civil society trying to play this role. It's much easier when you have top-down federal programs throwing money at these kinds of things. Um, and inherently it involves um, organizing things that we haven't before organized, and I don't know whether we can do it. But um, I, th I think that there are really interesting social science questions here about uh, transformation um, and, in, you know, huge interesting engineering and other problems uh, that could be solved with interesting research. So I hope that this is something that in the long term would appeal uh, to university-based researchers uh, as something to collaborate on. So um, thank you very much. I look forward to any questions or feedback or suggestions. Yeah, please go ahead. And I guess there's a mic that's going to circulate, is that right? Thank you. Um, I have a question on um, some actions that might be taken which actually would not involve research or would not involve much research. Uh, near the beginning of your talk, you mentioned the wildfires in California. And it's been known for some time that wildfires out there and uh, other states, Arizona, for example, have often been caused by electric wires, okay? They get struck by the wind or possibly lightning, and they come down, and then they set fires. And that's considered a human cause of the fires. Uh -huh. Now, how, how can you, what steps can be taken to reduce those human causes of wildfire? Uh, burying, burying the lines is an obvious uh, remedy, but would that be too expensive? Yeah, so I'm not a, a power engineer, so I'm not the right person to answer that question. Maybe somebody in the room is. But I think what, what you know, PG&E is, uh, there was an article in the paper yesterday saying that they're really worried about the liability. Uh, and there were some of these periods where it was forecast that conditions that could bring down lines would exist, where they actually shut them off and people's power, access to power was, was curtailed during the event um, as an anticipation of this possibility because of their legal liability. I don't know how long California is going to view that as an acceptable approach. I guess the people that were interviewed in this article said they were willing to put up with the short-term inconvenience of not having, elect, you know, having a power outage essentially to reduce the risk of fire. But um, it's, it's, a, it's a major issue, and so the question is partly of cost. You know, my understanding is burying these lines is hugely expensive. Um, and then feasibility, and then giving people better information about where they might sight lines, how can they make it, um, how can they redesign the system so it's less uh, sensitive to this or less vulnerable to it. Um, and so, you know, it's a long-term, it'll turn out short-term management, but also long-term planning and redesign. Uh, maybe distributed energy systems, you know, work you guys are doing on, on uh, solar, uh, photovoltaic, you know, maybe that becomes part of the solution. I don't know. But it needs to be, there needs to be a lot of conversation. Is anybody in the room specifically working on that problem? On um, redesign of grids to be more resistant to, you know, sparking and causing fires? Yeah. But I mean, that's a great example of the kind of thing where there's probably short term things that can be done, but in the longer term, I think it's going to resolve, require system redesign. And when you're doing that, you want to know what conditions to be designing for. Yeah, Eric. Or I say, okay, here, that's fine. Yeah, Rob, you go ahead and. 
So the the first like big thing I remember seeing in my lifetime about global warming was uh, that Al Gore documentary, The Inconvenient Truth. And it seems that, you know, it's been, what, 12 years since that? And it's like more and more panels and reports have come out since, but not too much action. And you said you had a lack of, do you have like any example you could think of where we confronted like a large scale environmental problem and then like set about a course of action and completed the course of action? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think there are, um, and maybe ozone is the best that I can think of where we had a problem with CFCs and other chemicals that were depleting the ozone layer, and where there was a clear uh, scientific result of what the problem was, and then industry got together. There was a set of what were called TAPs, time, uh, technical, economic, and uh, uh, assessment panels, I guess, technical and economic assessment panels, TAPs. And they put together and they had research, um, you know, DuPont and Dow and other providers of these chemicals were involved. They were able to design new chemicals. Some of them had, you know, bad implications for climate change, and so they themselves had to be redesigned. Um, to have shorter lifetimes um, and so forth. So that's an example where you know you now can track the ozone layer recovery. It's still in process, but it's been a really successful thing, and it involved new technology, but also international negotiations about a, pro a system for uh, allowing use of these uh, lower cost chemicals in some places over a transition period particularly for developing countries, and eventual then complete phase out of those chemicals. So this is a, di a more difficult problem, but there are some examples. I think we've made good progress up till now on um, uh, energy or, or water pollution and air pollution in this country. I think that those are also issues where we can point to some successes, although I think that in the courts there's weakening of how courts are requiring um, information for people to be able to bring suits, for example, to stop a local polluter. Um, and that's, again, not my area, but uh, an, an interesting thing to look at. So yes, we have some successes. Great. OK, I'll, I'll go next. Um, so you started out talking about this process as a, applied to both adaptation and mitigation. But most of your discussion seemed to be about um, adaptation. Is there a, can you talk more about the uh, sort of the mitigation side of it? Yeah, um, and that, that's a, it's a completely valid um, point that you make, Eric. And the, um, I think that most of the work has come out of people who are working on adaptation and this idea of co-production of knowledge that involves the end users as well as the scientists. But uh, when I think about um, the energy system of the future and the different components of it, you know, I don't know, again, I'm not an energy specialist, what the thinking is about how much, how important are different renewable energy types going to be and how climate sensitive are those. I know that the Department of Energy worries about the sensitivity of electric grids and so forth from the perspective of demand that's going to be affected by changes in climate. So you're going to have heating degree days go down, cooling degree days go up. How is that going to be reflected? Where are you going to have congestion on the grid? What sources of cooling water are going to be available? You know, that's been an issue already. Uh, having enough cooling water at the right temperature, and there have, have had to be a substantial number of deratings of power plants, um, you know, even conventional power plants that don't have cooling water that they can draw on, so they have to close it down uh, in, in uh, hot summer months. So um, it's those kinds of issues where, for mitigation, we're planning these new systems. We should be looking forward to the conditions under which they operate. And so that's when we talk about mitigation. It's those kinds of issues, the availability of climate science to help people plan a resilient grid in the future that would be have both some aspects of supply as well as uh, demand affected by climate change. Uh, but we're not as advanced in thinking about those examples. Um, it's something that I was thinking about last night as I was getting ready for the talk today and wished that I could find better material. I just didn't find a lot that looks at, you know, other than a few Department of Energy reports that look at climate sensitivity of the energy system. Yeah, Richard, the <coughs> your very first slide, you put the word consensus right along with assessment. 
And I've wondered, with relation to the IPCC reports, which have the same emphasis, whether it is fully serving your, the, uh, the inf per is this on? I don't think it is. I'm just closer to your mouth. Okay. Um, so I was asking about consensus as an objective of assessment. Uh, it has seemed to me that that is often collapsing the problem in a way that's not fair to the, to the uh, reader or actor to whom it is intended. Often you have bimodal distributions of opinion among the experts. And IPCC, I think, has been plagued with the drive to make sure none of those are shown. Uh, and I'm wondering why we're carrying that into a national program where we could do better. It's not often the case, but it's, it's often enough the case that there are places where, for example, on carbon sinks, uh, where there's just more than one, there's more than one uh, strongly held and defended view of a problem until time passes and things are cleared up. Right. Yeah, so I mean, Rob, that's a great point. And I, I use the word consensus always in conjunction with the word, the second word, uncertainty. And so for me, and I know the IPCC hasn't always done a great job on this, but for me, consensus involves the expert community agreeing on how to characterize the state of knowledge. Fine. So if you have a bimodal distribution, that has to be a, 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 an opinion about um, you know, an issue like the carbon cycle or climate sensitivity or whatever it might be. That distribution of opinion needs to be represented in the consensus statement. And it can be represented in two ways. One, the statement itself can say there are two leading schools of thought that we can't resolve. Here's the research that would be necessary to resolve it and when we could possibly get that done with resources. Or you have to represent in a statistical way that distribution of outcomes. Um, so when I use the word consensus, it's a characterization of the state of science that somebody else right now, if you go, you know, the situation is, Here's opinion A and opinion B. Is this important? This isn't important. The non-expert doesn't know what to do. Right. So it's using an expert consensus process to let people know about that. Does that make sense? It does. Uh, Lynn, go ahead, and then I'll have one more question after that. <laughs> oh, okay. I'll my... We do have a question over yep. here. I think I heard you make the observation that benefit costs wouldn't be very helpful in doing the analysis that you think has to be done. And then you also made a reference to robust decision models or approaches. Could you elaborate on both of those points? Sure. So the, the point about benefit cost, um, in the meetings and conversations and input we got from this um, state and city people was that they're required to do it. Not that it's appropriate or a good thing, but that if they want fund, if they want the city council to pass a measure, they have to have a cost-benefit analysis that shows that the benefits for the community are greater than the costs. So what the, what the, when I was referring to it was not in the sense that we're just going to take today's standard methodology, but there is work in, in, the, in the field um, in economics on how can you adapt benefit-cost analysis in a couple of ways. One, so that the time frames are more appropriate uh, for things like considering pay, long-term payback of some of these measures, because they don't necessarily pay dividends, dividends in the short term, they're longer term. Um, or uh, another challenge is that in many cases, um, people don't know how to use a baseline of, uh, say, a socioeconomic baseline, and then work off of that, considering the effects both of climate change, which could lower uh, economic returns, as well as some of the measures that could raise them. So it's really looking at a climate-adjusted benefit-cost analysis. Um, the robust decision-making work uh, is interesting because it, uh, I, I don't know, a specific example, say, is the work of Rob Lempert at RAND, uh, or Casey Brown up at UMass Amherst, uh, or Pat Reed at Cornell. Uh, the latter two do a lot of work with water utilities, uh, Rob's work is really uh, much broader than that. What they do is they'll identify, say, a threshold of an impact. Say, if you have a rainfall greater than two to two inches, 
um, that's going to cause flooding in a particular system. And they work with the water managers of that system to understand and identify what that threshold is. They then go and do a much more robust kind of statistical analysis of model results that look at how often that threshold is going to be crossed over time. And then they can tie that to a better calculation of costs and benefits from some of the safe flood control measures that would be uh, proposed so they have a better sense of what the outcome might be. So it's a more statistically robust kind of approach than just a cost benefit. Um, and there's a, it's, a, it's a really rapidly growing area. It's very exciting. Uh, Richard, so this is to follow up on, on uh, Rob's question and, and a little bit on, on what I think the person just had asked too. So you had started out saying that the IPCC report is heavy, heavily caveated, right? And, in, and so as a scientist, I appreciate sort of the statistic the statistics that's put in there, the confidence levels and things of that sort. But as sort of a lay person who accesses the report and wants to read it. It's it's really hard to go through and, and I think for sort of a person with an opposing perspective, they can read a 96% uncertain uh, a 96% confidence level as something that's not 100% certainty, right? And so how do how do you craft the message um, for, for the lay person so that they they understand sort of the impact and do you do this with with your report? Well, we need to involve people like Elka to help us do that. Um, I think we do it terribly right now. And, and because, it's, it's of, hard to because of Rob's question earlier that says, you know, when you use consensus, people understand it as you're trying to sweep opposing opinion under the rug. You're really between a rock and a hard place. And we've tried to think this through. And I don't think we've come up with a good approach. You know, the 90, you know, we give the 95% confidence interval and people say, well, it's only there because you're sweeping opposing opinion under the rug. And you give them all the caveats and they don't understand what the message is that they should be taking away from it. So work I did with Steve Schneider uh, a long time ago and it's been modified over the years, kind of tries to think about confidence levels and providing traceable accounts that explain for the main conclusions of a report, what's the chain of evidence and where is it strong and where isn't it strong. So it's describing um, the evidence to people who would like to know. Um, but at the same time, just giving a summary judgment about level of confidence. Um, and, you know, and we've tested different ways of expressing it both graphically and with words um, that would communicate. But I, I don't think we have a solution yet. I don't know, Elke, if you want to comment on that. <laughs> if, I, if I can have a second comment, um, I am surprised at this last exchange because the people you're dealing with are making decisions under uncertainty from the minute they walk into the office to the minute they leave with every, every allocation of, the civil, uh, of a town budget. They don't know what, what, exactly what the situation is and you think you could explain to them. I mean, it's usually discussions about whether you can motivate a voter and things of that sort, but these guys and businessmen and people in the military are confronting uh, that kind of problem, of risk assessment, all the time. Two other, one is, I had, did, is one of the functions, as you see it, of this uh, civil society consortium, the spreading of best practices. They would think that would be right up there. And the other is reordering of a set of priorities that are already in place, because most of what's in the working group two world of, of adaptation is stuff that we're doing, we want to do anyway. And I would put an emphasis on how much reordering is necessary. Is it pretty much the right order to begin with, rather than the notion that you're going to have to drop everything you know and start over again? Well, so, um, you know, the, I think that there are different audiences, Rob, and some of them are the more technical, technically oriented audiences, and they are the ones who understand uncertainty and, and the fact that it pervades everything. But then there are others who don't and who have been told that this is going to require drastic changes in our way of life and they're going to have to you know, turn the lights out and live in cold rooms to solve it. Uh, and so they want a very high standard. You know, and, they, and they're the ones who aren't necessarily very clear and clear-headed about this. So I think the point I'm trying to make is you need different methods for different audiences. right? And that's a, that's a crucial thing that we recognize. Um, in terms of priorities, um, I think that the question is just an operational or tactical one for this group. What do we work on first? You know, there's going to be 
water, heat stress, uh, fires, um, you know, water both too much and too little, um, impacts on different economic sectors. Everybody's going to want their problem first in the queue, and we can't do everything at once. So there's going to need to be some kind of an orderly decision-making process for this organization about which things it focuses on first. Um, a prior, sort of a, a prioritization in a very narrow way. But um, you know, to me, the, the most important thing that's not really being looked at, um, but I was just talking to Eric and learned that there's a project here that is working on this, is the energy system transition that we have to have if any of the targets that people are talking about, a one and a half degree C target or a two degree C target, are going to be possible. And IPCC just released this 1.5 C report which has a lot of information on the relative impacts of one and a half degrees C and two degrees C. And that's an important issue, but it's not going to get us to the solution. And several of us argued that the report should be much more about um, what can we learn from other periods of rapid transition? How fast could we make this stuff happen? What are the bottlenecks going to be? Um, you know, to me, that's where we don't have a sense of priorities and where we really need one. So to follow up on that a little bit, when I was looking at your, your network and network, one way at least I was thinking of it is that there's kind of two components in terms of the transfer of information, that there's the part that's going from the physical climate realm with the uncertainties of temperature, precip, sea level, to that of the impacts realm that's going to translate that information into how it affects things people care about, ecosystems, human health, yep. water services, all, all that. And then there's the part that's going to then go from there, from the impacts realm, to the practitioners and the decision makers, and so kind of viewing it as, as, as two steps. So I'm just wondering if in terms of the prioritization or some other things you just talked about, some might be uh, easier than others. Are there, are there certain hurdles either that you think are going to be more difficult to overcome or maybe easier for a network, a network to, to fill in gaps currently, whether it's between the physical climate and the impacts or the impacts and the practitioners. It seems like sometimes we, we fall back on it's gotten very easy to exchange data. We can put it on servers. We can have reports as PDFs, but the, the knowledge or the guidance on how to use it is more, more difficult. So anyway, I guess the main question, are there certain low-hanging fruit or certain hurdles you're more concerned about than others on that chain? Um, well, I guess I think the chain is going to vary depending on the issue. And so I think an area where we're further along in understanding is water, uh, water resources. And it's interesting in a couple of ways. There is a project that the Department of Energy is funding called the Hyperion Project um, that is being led from Berkeley Lab, um, the Climate Modeling Group. And it involves a, co a, a collaboration between the climate modelers and uh, water managers. Um, and they've been talking pretty successfully. Um, and it works in two ways. One is that the water managers are explaining what the metrics are. They're very different. You know, they have to do with volume of precipitation over particular periods of time, evapotranspiration issues, you know, all, every, all the things that would affect the availability of water resources in a watershed. Um, and what's identified is metrics that then the, the scientists are using to better evaluate their models. Right? And so that then leads the climate scientists to understand where are the models weak and where are they strong, as you well know. And then you can start to devise research that helps to improve the models. And are not, you know, some of it may have to go back to basic processes that we don't understand in the climate system, as well as just how those get represented in models. So um, that part of the chain, I think, is working pretty well. And the water managers, because of the things that Rob said, they are already used to dealing with uncertainty. Um, I think they maybe need to understand the difference between the uncertainty in a weather forecast and the uncertainty in a climate projection. Um, I don't know that everybody fully grasps that because the second is uncertain because we don't know what the emissions look like in the future and we have deep uncertainty about you know, the role of technologies and the economy and population growth and where people are living that drive some of that. Um, so uh, you know, the, there's still a better state of dialogue in that level than I think elsewhere. 
Um, one of the areas where I think that we're starting to make progress but still is further back is health. Um, um, particularly when you think about health as affected by high temperature events and air quality. Um, there's work going, but not there yet. Okay. Well, I think that, I mean, the, um, it, you're absolutely right. So it's a huge challenge, and I don't know, you know, I've never designed anything like this myself, um, and I haven't found anybody yet that I think is the next executive director of it. Um, but I think the initial thing is just getting started. You know, our model is to pick, is to get this organization set up and get enough money to do one of these, to do a pilot. You know, we have some ideas about how to categorize the, the problems. But it's not really a typology, as you would know, of what these problems are and how we should organize them. And we had that idea about maybe evaluating in an implementation cycle where are the blockages and what information do people need in specific problem areas. But that may not prove productive. But we have to start somewhere. Um, and my hope is if we can just get enough resource, and we're not talking about a lot of resource here, it's a couple million dollars a year for the beginnings of this oper of the operation, um, to test one or two, we'll learn from that, we'll improve, and over time I think we'll be able to build it out. So the point is not to be daunted by, at least this is what I tell myself when I wake up, not to be daunted by the, mag you know, the magnitude of this and trying to bring it about, but just to put one step, you know, my job is to wake up and move the step, and then I'll move the next one the next day. Thanks for coming.